Yeah. We, we just start now. L ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this um, very important session on Africa. And in previous occasions, we've had the benefit of some great speakers, but I don't think there's an occasion when we've had together five leaders of Africa, three presidents, and two prime ministers. And I feel very privileged to have been asked to chair this session with people who are also my friends, but people who have done so much uh, to boost the image of Africa in the world and change the face of Africa. The former managing director of the World Bank, uh, Ningozi, who is with us in the audience uh, today, asked the question once, which was the economy, the one trillion dollar economy, that had grown over the last 10 years faster than India and was to grow in the next few years faster than Brazil? And of course, the answer is sub-Saharan Africa, which has not only recovered very quickly from the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, but has enormously important uh, resources, has shown huge advances in the development of telecommunications in recent years, and has reforming presidents and prime ministers who want to see new investment coming into Africa. But of course, at the same time, when we know that Africa, with 15% of the population of the world, has only 1% of the world's manufacturing, has only 1% of the stock of inward investment, uh, we know that there are huge challenges for a continent that has got more poverty per head of the population than any other continent in the world. So I want to start today by asking what are going to be the forces of change that will improve the performance of Africa, which has already shown that it is making a difference, and whether it's infrastructure having to be improved or education, or whether it's the development of IT, or whether it's regional cooperation, or whether it's greater trade with the rest of the world, whether it's the development of many new industries, the removal of red tape and regulation, I want you to hear from the presidents and the prime ministers what they have to say, and then I want to give you the chance of asking questions. There is a history of audience participation in Africa sessions. I was uh, sitting on the platform a few years ago uh, with Bill Gates and with President Makapa uh, and with others uh, from Africa, uh, and the audience uh, uh, managed to steal the show because Sharon Stone uh, took over uh, and uh, I felt sorry for Bill Gates because he promised a billion dollars for the treatment of uh, polio uh, and Sharon Stone promised $10,000 and she got all the publicity. <laughs> now, our panel is just uh, magnificent in its uh, scope and in the status of the people we've got. Uh, President Zuma, as you know, is leading Africa in so many different ways and has just uh, celebrated a great anniversary for the African National uh, Congress. Uh, Prime Minister Meles has led the African reform movement uh, with his chairmanship of that uh, group. Uh, and of course, major advances have been made in education in particular in Ethiopia in recent years. Prime Minister Odinga, I worked with him over the last few years as he tried to make sure that there was peace in his own country and develop uh, better services right across the pop population. President Kikwete is a leader in his own right, former president of the African uh, Union, and his country has made major advances. And President Conley is here, and he will talk about the great resources of his own country and how he sees that develop in future years. So we have this great panel, and I would like to start by asking President uh, Zuma, uh, Jacob Zuma, what you think are the big forces for change and progress over the next few years in Africa. Jacob, the floor is yours. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> uh, firstly, to you and uh, the opportunity that we get. Is the mic on? Can we make yes. sure the mic yes. is on? I think it's on now. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> firstly, I think um, we could ask as to what can Africa do uh, differently? Uh, given the challenges that face the globe today, Africa has grown faster in the past 10 years, as we have just alluded to that. The latest IMF World Economic Outlook says that uh, Africa's growth will still be almost 5.5% in 2012 and 5.3% 
in 2013, Africa has moved steadily towards free, multi-party, and accountable political systems <clears throat> since the end of the Cold War. The struggle against poverty in the continent of Africa has made some progress. In other words, we've made progress to try to deal with those challenges in our continent. We are also moving to achieve Millennium Development Goals, economic governance in Africa has improved, management of fiscal and monetary policies is much stronger than 20 or 30 years ago. <clears throat> Those are factors, in fact, that might account for why Africa has seen the growth. The biggest risk to Africa, though, <clears throat> in the transition is that there is a broad economic slump worldwide and prices of commodities fall sharply. This could cause severe shocks in African economies dependent on commodity exports. Another risk is that uh, African leaders may overestimate their good fortune and borrow too much funds for long-term investments projects. A third risk is that expectations of ordinary Africans might be frustrated in the short term and the democratic processes could be stretched and severely tested by the situation because if people agree that there's democracy but they, don't, they do not see the dividends, <clears throat> then they might say, is it working? African economies must be diversified so that when commodities prices land in the world, there are other strong economic activities to fall back on. Africans must trade among themselves something which has been lacking. The launch of the free trade area in June last year is a step in the right direction with regard to Africa doing its own intra-trade. <clears throat> Africa must invest sufficiently in education and skills development, especially scarce skills which are needed by the economy such as engineers, artisans, and other technical skills. We cannot be only strong in the humanities field only. I'm sure for a long time we've been, but everyone will know that once we do that, we are taken by other countries to come and help lecture other people instead of developing our own continent. Africa must invest in health services and health education. Africa's development partners remain vital to Africa in both the developed North and developing South. So in the end, it will come down to leadership effectiveness. In other words, how do Africa lead itself? as it has been showing the growth. We need to focus on the long term and build foundations for sustainable growth in our continent. And part of that is what we have just referred to, the improvement and the establishment of very <clears throat> massive infrastructure that must be able to connect Africa so that Africa is able to do business within itself, and that those who come to invest in Africa must take into account that it must be a two-way kind of uh, activity, wherein you invest to benefit Africa so that you could also benefit out of it. But one of the things that, as, as my, my last little point, 
is that the countries that have held influence over Africa over the period must change their attitude. They must interact with Africa to help Africa, not interact with Africa to help themselves. I think that will go a long way to help us move and change the manner in which we do things. We are very optimistic as a leadership in Africa. We believe Africa is on the move and <clears throat> it, it depends on us. And I think there's been an agreement on us that we need to look to ourselves and develop ourselves to be a continent that is dynamic, that is prepared to interact with other continents at the equal footing. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank, you very, thank you very much. And we'll take up some of these points as we go through the hour. Uh, I pass over to Prime Minister Meles, who was on the Africa Commission and chairs uh, the reform group. Uh, please uh, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm very happy uh, that I have this uh, opportunity to link up with uh, uh, an old and, and, and true friend of Africa. Thank you for your uh, support in the past. Let me start by saying that I, uh, I fully agree with uh, what uh, uh, the President of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, just said. Uh, but let me highlight a few points. What is it that we in Africa are now talking about? Uh, we know we have grown faster over the past 10 years uh, than has been the case traditionally. On that basis, we believe that Africa can and will be the next growth pole of the global economy. We believe we are where India was in the early 90s. We are about the same size in terms of population, and so we're talking about the next growth pole in the world. That's our ambition, and it's not idle ambition, it's based on the results of the past few years. In order to do that, uh, we need to do many things that uh, have been mentioned by the President, but I would like to highlight a few points. First, infrastructure. There's a lot of infrastructure bottlenecks, power, roads, telecommunication, railways, ports, you name it, we need more investment there and better management of the infrastructure services that we have. That is key. Uh, second, we need better skills for our people. Uh, we need to do more by way of investment in primary education as part of the Millennium Development Goals, but we are not going to develop and industrialize our countries on the basis of primary education. We need a lot more than primary education. We need to build on the investment that has been done in primary education to promote technical and vocational training and university education and link up our universities with day-to-day -day activities. So skill formation, skill development is, in my view, the next big thing that we need to, to do. And thirdly, we need to, um, I am convinced that uh, many of the labor intensive manufacturing facilities in Asia will, are already relocating and we will relocate faster in the coming years. Where to is a question. I believe Africa is the, is, is the natural destination for these factories and manufacturing facilities. Uh, and we need to uh, create the uh, environment for them to relocate uh, to Africa. And besides infrastructure and skills, we need partnerships, the win-win partnerships that, uh, that President uh, uh, Zuma was talking about. Not only with the Asian manufacturers, the uh, Koreans, the Chinese, the Indians, and so on, but also the European and American manufacturers. They have already relocated to China, for example, or Vietnam. Or we, if they are thinking of relocating again, then Africa is the next destination, and we won't have these uh, uh, partnerships. Final point, we as Africans need to diversify our economies. Traditionally, people have thought of Africa as a source of mining resources. That's very important and we need more, better use of our mining potential. But we need to invest more in agriculture, particularly small-scale agriculture, because without it, there will not be inclusive growth, and therefore there will not be social peace to get us through this economic transition. And we also need to invest in manufacturers. Thank you.
infrastructure, education, manufacture, uh, and trade, of course. Uh, Prime Minister Odinga, I, I visited uh, a school with you many years ago yes. in Kibera when you had put a million children into school by making education free, so education is a very important part of your agenda as well. Yes, uh, Gordon, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here to join this uh, very distinguished panel. Um, Gordon, I think first we begin by saying that uh, the African the transition to transformation in Africa is a very interesting subject. And first we begin by talking about inclusivity, because when we're talking about sustainable growth and development of the continent. And this requires to involve more people. Um, so African democracy is actually now on course, and there are resistances and pockets of resistance here and there. But by and large, I think that um, a lot of progress has been made. And also the Arab Spring lesson is coming down south very fast. Now, we uh, want first to ensure that we have democratic constitutions, uh, that people accept democratic governance. Uh, that is important. Our population is fairly young and uh, we can actually benefit from demographic dividends by uh, empowering this young population. And that's why we are talking about manpower development. Education, uh, quality education that is from primary, secondary, uh, vocational training, um, uh, university and technical colleges, um, as well as research. Uh, uh, and development generally. You need to invest there because if you do this then we can create skilled manpower that will be attractive to investors and that in our view is how China and India have moved on because they've become very attractive to investment. You've got highly skilled manpower but which is also cheap and competitive. This in our view is, is very very crucial and important. The other factor that one want to flag here is um, transformation from dependence on commodity uh, trade to more science and technology based economy. Um, a number of our economies are still fairly dependent on commodity trade. Uh, this in my view is not sustainable. So we therefore need to move towards adapting more technology in our development, value addition to goods that are produced in our, our, our countries. Um, here we are leading by example in Kenya. As you know that um, we have been doing quite a lot of development and research. For example, in telecommunications area, we have led the world by the invention of uh, money transfer through mobile phones. So, and this is making um, um, uh, business much more efficient in our country. And this is an example that is now being emulated in India and other countries, what we call M-Pesa, to transfer money uh, through using mobile phones and several others. So we really want to see inventions coming from Africa. Uh, coming out of Africa. Therefore, we should promote research and development generally. Finally, infrastructure. Uh, I've talked about social infrastructure, physical infrastructure that will help us to integrate the African continent. Investment in roads, in ports, in um, uh, railways, which will then make the Africa, intra-African trade more viable. See, uh, intra African trade is still negligible. If you look at Europe, Europe trades more with itself than with the rest of the world. Uh, Africa can also trade more with itself. Uh, Africa is looking more and more to the north rather than to itself, yet African market is big. <clears throat> so we need to invest also in physical infrastructure fast so that we can promote intra-African trade. 
So diversification, infrastructure, the common market, internal trade. Uh, President Kikwete, yeah. I pass on to you. Thank you okay. very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, moderator, Prime Minister Gordon Brown. <clears throat> Well, indeed, the, the subject for discussion here is Africa transition and transformation. Well, indeed, one can say that there is transform, transformation taking place in Africa. There is a lot of ample evidence to, to, to that fact. Um, when you look at the social economic life of our people and our nations, in education, in healthcare, in infrastructure development, in agriculture, in manufacturing, and so forth and so on. But much more needs to be done. This is the bottom line. Because there are times when Africa is portrayed as if there is nothing happening. But I'm, I, I'm, I would say the contrary. There is a lot of happening. But much more needs to be done. And why? Because we are, we are starting from very low levels of development. At independence 50 years ago, Tanzania, the, the GDP per capita was $35. There were only three tarmac roads, the length of uh, less than 190 kilometers. And we are a country with 85,000 kilometers of roads network. So, this, this, we're starting from very low levels, development, diseases, deprivations of all sorts of, we're, 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 we're plenty. But also we are, we, we are part, of the, part of the global economy. So whatever is happening in, in, in some parts of the world definitely affects us. A few years ago we had the global economic financial crisis and we had reversals to our growth. Now we have a lot of anxiety with the Eurozone crisis. I hope it's going to be fixed quickly so that if, if, if it doesn't, then there is going to be many, many problems. There is evidence of growth, high levels of growth. I think this is the fastest growing continent now. But the dangers are still there. So what more needs to be done uh, to be very precise? In my view, one, Africa must stay the cause in pursuit of sound economic policies. Because it is the sound economic policies which has enabled many of our countries to attain macroeconomic stability. The higher the level, high, low inflation rates, high levels of growth. So we should stay the cause in pursuit of sound economic policies. We should invest more in education primary, secondary, tertiary, technical training, in order to, to build the, the human resource. Because at the end of the day, it is the, the man or woman who is going to make things happen and not the machines. You can have the machines. If you don't have the competent people to use the machines, then nothing can happen. So education is, is critical for us as, as an as a, a major investment. We should invest more in the transformation of agriculture. To me, agriculture is a priority because 70 to 80 percent of our people live in rural areas, and agriculture is the mainstay. But it is subsistence agriculture. People live from hand to mouth. They cannot feed themselves. They don't have enough cash crops to be able to earn more to transform their lives, make their life better. We need to develop the manufacturing sector. We cannot continue to be primary producers. Produce raw materials for the others to go and, and, and make goods, finish goods, and then come back. I was saying my, 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 my late professor of economics at the university who taught me, he used to have a good phrase that we produce what we don't consume and consume what we don't produce. <laughs> <laughs> We produce for the others, so that the others produce for us to consume. This thing cannot continue. So that's why ensuring that the manufacturing sector is growing fast in Africa is, is also critical. We have abundant resources, mineral resources, 
agricultural resources, natural resources, but what is lacking is a vibrant manufacturing sector, which, which Africa should also look at. And in any case, economies transit from being predominantly agricultural, then they go to the manufacturing, and then they go to the service, to that service sector becoming the predominant ones. So this is, this is another important aspect. We have to develop the infrastructure. Well, as I'm saying, we had only three, three, three roads in, in the country with a, with a demand of 85,000 square kilo, of kilometers of roads. Without roads, there is no development. There is no development without electricity. There is no development without telecommunications. Africa cannot continue to be left behind in the, in the digital divide, definitely. We have, we, have to, we have to catch up. The other thing is regional integration. If, 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 we, if, we, if we say we are going to, to produce more from agriculture, produce more from manufacturing, definitely markets are essential. May the regional markets, but also the international markets. For regional markets, of course, the regional economic groupings are an important factor. This is, this is a, a song now in the whole of the African continent. The regional economic groupings everywhere, and we are continuously strengthening them. We are now looking at even merging them. Uh, in July, we had a meeting in South Africa where we discussed the creating a, a grand free trade area bringing together Southern African development community, the East African community, and common market for Southern, Southern and Central Africa from Cape to Cairo. I was saying in Addis Ababa, in, in, Cape, in South Africa the other day, C.C. John Rhodes, the colonist, talked of uh, the, Great the Great North Road from Cape to Cairo, but this was for colonial purposes. We, we, are, breeding, we, we are doing it now. For our, own, for, our, for our own good. This is an aspect. But also, at the international level, now we need, we need access to, to markets. That's why, to us in Africa, early conclusion of DEHA development agenda, the round is, 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 is so critical so that we can remove, open up these markets, remove trade distorting subsidies in, in the developed countries so that we can have access to the market. I can say that for the beginning, since it's going to happen. Let, let me say that to start with. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, President uh, Conde, resources in Africa, very resource rich. Are resources being or could be far better used? Uh, President Conde. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Modérateur. Thank you very much indeed. C'est la première fois que la Guinée assiste à une telle réunion. Parce que pendant des dizaines d'années, on a connu la dictature. And je suis le premier président démocratiquement élu. Et moi, je veux surtout parler de la Nouvelle Afrique. Je like crois que la première chose la plus importante, c'est d'abord de changer la vision que le monde extérieur a de l'Afrique. On parle de l'Afrique, des guerres, des décisions, etc. Il faut qu'on montre qu'il y a aujourd'hui une nouvelle Afrique où la démocratie avance, où la jeunesse compte de plus de 70%. Mais le plus important aussi, c'est qu'il faut que nous, les leaders africains, nous changeons. Le plus fondamental, c'est ça. C'est-à-dire que nous n'arrivons pas à changer parce que nous restons enfermés dans nos frontières, dans nos petits if we, if we remain et within our own borders, looking at our own countries, we don't see the essential points. points. If we don't use Lorsque the experience from other countries to advance, pays, when we do take the example from other countries, par, uh, I mean, uh, au fond, look at the European coal and steel community. The European coal and steel community in Europe, that was where it all started. So what we need today is infrastructure, intra-African trade, and trade. And self-respect. Lorsque l'Union Européenne convoque une réunion à 9h, tout le monde est là à 9h et jusqu'à la fin. Nous, quand on convoque une réunion de l'Union Africaine à 9h, on commence à midi, c'est une réunion à midi, à 13h. C'est-à-dire qu'au fond, nous ne posons pas au niveau de l'Union Africaine des mille temps pour venir. Aujourd'hui, si nous voulons avancer, nous devons mettre en avant nos capacités. Si nous nous mettons d'accord aujourd'hui, en très peu de temps, nous pouvons avoir de l'énergie. Si seulement qu'on se mette d'accord pour faire les grands barrages, Inga, soit tout 
d'énergie, etc., casser les barrières commerciales qu'il y a entre différents pays et avoir un véritable marché africain satellite au fond, il serait important qu'on fasse comme la CEC, c'est-à-dire qu'on ait un ministre de l'énergie qui est chargé de toute la politique africaine et qui permet de développer une ministre des infrastructures un ministre du commerce extérieur, mais et ensuite que nous nous respections nous-mêmes. C'est-à-dire que quand nous avons des réunions, au lieu d'avoir 10 sujets à l'ordre du jour à l'Union africaine, qu'on ait seulement deux ou trois qui constituent l'essentiel. Parce que cette nouvelle Afrique est représentée par la jeunesse et les femmes qui sont extrêmement dynamiques. Nous avons un autre avantage, une accélération de l'histoire. Donc si nous renforçons l'éducation et que nous maîtrisons les nouvelles technologies, là où les autres ont mis 20 ans, nous mettons peut-être 2 ans ou 3 ans. Mais cela suppose qu'il y ait un changement au niveau des dirigeants. Mais tant que nous ne changeons pas nous-mêmes et que nous ne montons pas que notre intérêt, c'est de développer les ressources nationales pour le peuple et non plus pour avoir des comptes dans les banques extérieures, et deuxièmement, que nous sommes décidés à créer des véritables conditions pour favoriser l'investissement extérieur et que nous voulons une coopération gagnant-gagnant, nous n'aurons pas de la banque. Donc il faut que l'extérieur se rende compte qu'il y ait une nouvelle Afrique et que cette nouvelle Afrique est différente des images qu'on présente à l'Afrique. Mais le plus important, ce que je dis à mes collègues, il faut que nous changeons nos comportements, que nous nous respections, que nous respections l'Afrique et que nous soyons réellement au service du peuple. Nous sommes le grenier de l'Afrique, nous pouvons être le grenier de l'Afrique. Nous pouvons, au fond, l'objectif, c'est de produire ce que nous consommons et consommer ce que nous produisons tout à l'heure. Mon cher frère, mais si nous ne changeons pas l'image de l'Afrique, si nous ne changeons pas le comportement, si les gens pensent que nous ne nous intéressons pas au peuple, alors que nous avons la chance d'avoir un peuple qui gère 70% de la population de 30 ans, que nous avons la capacité de maîtriser rapidement les nouvelles technologies et d'avancer très vite. Moi, mon pays a connu la désertion pendant longtemps. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes décidés, étant donné nos grandes capacités minières, nous avons à faire en sorte que tous les pays se préoccupent de transformer ces matières premières au service d'avoir des populations et de créer des conditions que les partenaires aussi acceptent que les richesses profitent à l'Afrique, que nous puissions aussi nous les créer des meilleures conditions pour que les investissements soient à l'Afrique. Mais le changement en Afrique dépend d'abord de nous, de nous les dirigeants africains. Nous avons beaucoup de défauts, nous sommes un peu égoïstes et nous ne voyons pas d'abord l'Afrique, nous nous battons souvent pour les postes, alors que nous devons nous concentrer sur ce qui est le véritable plan d'Afrique, l'énergie, les infrastructures, le commerce interne et les échanges, et surtout la maîtrise des nouvelles technologies. Je ne veux pas être non, mais moi je suis là pour montrer qu'il y a une nouvelle Afrique, et cette nouvelle Afrique peut être, peut faire en sorte que l'Afrique soit le continent de, de, du XXIe siècle. C'est ça que nous devons faire, que l'Afrique, si on a été pendant longtemps en arrière, que le XXIe siècle soit le continent de l'Afrique. Well, these are five very powerful statements about uh, both the need for change and the desire for progress uh, in, in Africa. I'm going to break uh, down what's been said because there's a huge consensus into a number of issues that perhaps the audience has got questions about and is worried about. First of all, let's take infrastructure. So there are less roads in Africa now than 30 years ago. Half the roads of Asia, of Latin America, only 10% of trade in Africa is internal to Africa, partly because of the infrastructure. Now, a lot of people in the audience would say, well, you've got to remove some of the obstacles to making it possible for people to invest in infrastructure. There are legal problems, there are problems of corruption, there are problems of dealing with a number of different countries when there are cross-border projects, there is red tape, things take too long. Everybody knows the infrastructure need, but we've got to make it easier for people to get the investment in. I don't know if Donald Kabarukas, is Donald here, Kabaruka? Uh, from the African Development Bank, but he would say, I think there's about 100 billion of investment a year needed in infrastructure in Africa. Can you convince people who are potential investors that you can remove these uh, blockages that appear to have existed in the past? Jacob, do you want to start? You've got great projects that you've announced for north-south uh, 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 infrastructure. Can they get off the ground if we can solve these problems? Uh, yes, yes, they can certainly get off the ground. I, I think we have recognized the obstacles yeah. that uh, 
Prime Minister is referring to. Uh, the African Union has taken a very conscious decision on the question of the infrastructure. And it has taken that decision fully aware of what is it. We, among ourselves, talk about these borders that makes it very difficult for us to move within the continent. Accompanying, therefore, the infrastructure development is also the addressing of the bottlenecks that are there between the countries, which are not necessarily of our creation, and we have realized that. <coughs> and we are saying in order for us to be able to move forward, Developing the infrastructure would not be helpful if we could not use them because of the restrictions between countries. So we are fully aware of that. Uh, we are addressing those issues, that these bottlenecks should not be there because they inhibit the faster development and the movement within the continent. So these matters are dealt with, are actually being discussed in the regions. Yep. How do we open up uh, the borders? for a free flow of uh, people, workers, as well as the goods. So that is being addressed simultaneously with the development of the infrastructure. Now, now before I move on, is there any question from the audience about this vital issue of infrastructure? It's very difficult to see if uh, people have their hands there. up. There's a hand there. Yeah, please. My name is Ahmed Hekel. I'm the chairman of Citadel Capital. We have $10 billion invested in Africa. Recently, we have $350 million to form the railway in Kenya. Uh, that was financed through uh, a lot of multinational institutions. Uh, the African Development Bank is one of them. But, uh, and we have a, a big investment in Ethiopia. Uh, we're looking to make an additional investment in Kenya and in Tanzania. The problem that we face in many cases is the bandwidth at the top level. Uh, in Africa, you need to reach the top level. And the, the bandwidth that exists there is not always available. So even with $10 billion of investments in Africa now, sometimes you're not able to get the bandwidth. Okay, I've got that point. Is there any other point before I put it back to the panel on infrastructure? Can I see can you see in a moment? Would you like to answer that question, uh, uh, Prime Minister Odinga? Well, um, thank you, um, Gordon. Um, first, uh, uh, what he did not say is that uh, there's a history to their coming into this, that um, we felt the railway was concessioned, that is, the, the Kenya-Uganda railway first to a South African company, uh, which turned out to have somehow cheated in the deal. Right. And uh, the deal then went sour. So then they bought the shares yep. from that South African company right. and, and came, came then on board. And then you know, they started first negotiating through that South African company. Um, we are sort of very keen uh, to modernize the railway and make the railway work because right now 95% of the cargo coming out of the port of Mombasa is going by road, which is actually uh, doing quite a lot of damage to the road network. Uh, we have actually um, made it fairly easy. We, what is happening is that we are negotiating with the Ministry for Transportation, which, which is actually in charge of this. Yep. Now, I don't know which bandwidth is talking about because um, the, oh, he says that does not apply to Kenya. Th thank you. I'm not going to get into the individual uh, detail of the, uh, the projects. Okay. We, could be, we, we, could, we could be here all day. Uh, Perhaps I should move the issue, the issue on. Yeah. I'll, I'll have your model, uh, Prime Minister Meles, of moving, if you like, from a customs union to a common market to a single market, rather similar to the European Union, and that would open up trade within Africa, backed up by infrastructure development, and how quickly that can happen. I, I know you've, uh, you're not as keen on a single currency at the moment as you used to be, but on the common market and the single market, is that going to move ahead with speed? 
Yeah, the, the, this whole agenda of uh, uh, regional economic integration uh, in the continent uh, has been an ongoing process, yeah. uh, and it's been accelerated uh, in uh, in the recent past. The more we uh, our economy uh, becomes dynamic, the more it becomes diversified, the more we'll be able to trade yeah. uh, between ourselves. The intra-Africa trade is not is hindered not only by infrastructure, but also by the structure of our economies. Yes. Our economies have been structured to service other, particularly European economies, and now Asian economies, with very little linkage between ourselves. And so the, the, uh, the, the regional economic integration is an instrument of, uh, of economic transformation, and in my view, it's also a result of economic transformation. We can't have meaningful economic integration without transforming our economies. And with regards to uh, infrastructure and availability of uh, top leaders for uh, investors, uh, in the short run, we have to do better of, of being accessible uh, as uh, senior leaders uh, in government. In the long term, that is not a solution. The institutions of government will have to work efficiently so that things can move without the president or the prime minister saying so. That ultimately, that's, that's the, the, the way forward. But in, as a sort of a transitional arrangement, we need to be uh, a bit more available than we have been in the past. One other part of infrastructure is obviously IT, the development of high technology um, uh, and, and to get it into uh, different parts of Africa. I think we've got Tim Berners-Lee here, who's the head of the World Wide Web Foundation and uh, I think should be acknowledged as the person who invented the World Wide Web. Tim, is there anything that you think could be done uh, that could speed things up in Africa? Is Tim here? Yeah. Can you give him a mic? Yeah. Well, it's huge, but uh, obviously, uh, so the World Wide Foundation would, uh, uh, would love to see the other 80% of people who don't use the web at the moment using the web. Uh, there are huge numbers of ways in which it helps. I, and I think it's not just a question of getting uh, connectivity, of getting a fiber or getting a wire in. It's a question of getting people really using it uh, in their own language, not just reading things, uh, but writing things as well. So that the, the cultures of all the different languages are preserved and so that people across the world who uh, of that culture who's left can uh, connect back. Obviously, to, uh, it should be a huge economic benefit. It should be able to help education. It should be able to help health. And uh, also, it should be able to help uh, your governments be more transparent as you put uh, uh, government data onto the web, as the Gordon Brown made a huge uh, a project to do in the, in the UK. So you know, the Web Foundation will be very interested in uh, working with you to see what are the most, uh, the most important things to push now to try and to get the greatest change as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, President Kikwete, uh, IT technology and education, but also there's still, what, 35 million to 40 million children not at school at all in Africa. And obviously there's only 6% of uh, young people in vocational uh, further education. How quickly can you move education forward, do you think? <clears throat> well, of course we... One, maybe before I take up that one, let, let, let me say something, a few things about infrastructure. We should not come out of this meeting with an impression that there isn't much being invested in, in, in infrastructure because of some of the problems on, on our side. Um, Take the, tele, the telecommunications, for example. There is so much that is, that is being invested in the, in the mobile phone. Now, I, I, I think Africa is now the fastest growing market yes. in, in the mobile phone technology. It is our countries. It is the same leaders. There are some infrastructure aspects which do not attract private sector investment. And one of these is roads. Because for a private investor to invest in a road, 
there have to be cars so that they can charge <coughs> toll and take back their money. There are few cars in Africa. So in, with road infrastructure, essentially for several years to come, it will be more of the government getting involved in it. And because we are governments of poor countries, this is where development partners are critical to help Africa get the roads. Because when, when I was Minister of Foreign Affairs, we were working on the East African Road Network. We jointly set together with, with the World Bank, Infrastructure Department of the World Bank, where we, we, de we developed this network. And then I led a delegation to Washington, talked to the World Bank, to the European Union, to Brussels, I went to Japan. But one of the advice we got from that was that if you have less than 15,000 cars plying that road, then you can't. And in East Africa at that time, it was only the, the, the Mombasa-Nairobi road that had the largest number of cars, and there were only 6,000. So you can see this, this, this is one thing that we should come out of this and don't think that the, the problem is, 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 is government or the, the last bandwidth. And then, of course, if we are ready, for example, with the railway, Rwanda, Burundi, and Tanzania, we are working on a railway from the port of Dar es Salaam to Kigali to Bujumbura. It needs about, about 4,000, 4, 4, 4 billion dollars. We are looking for partners. If Heikel is ready, come there. But Heikel is interested in the railway that is already there. So, <laughs> it's not an issue of, of, of the, if there is anybody who is ready to invest in the railway from Dar es Salaam to Kigali to Bujumbura, and later we'll extend it to, 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 Eastern, to the Eastern DRC, let him come forward, come and see me. We'll be in business. We'll talk to President Kagame, President Nkuruziza, and myself. We, 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 we'll get a deal. Come forward. We want you to come there. So I'm saying the, the, we, we, the, we, the telecommunications, a lot of interest. Electricity is another area where we are, we are, where we are now opening up. We want to see more investors come for electricity. We do not have that in, in, in the past. So I'm saying, and if you have to see the president in order to see things move, then there, something must be terribly wrong. These are matters that should be finished at the investment centers and, and, and the line ministries that, that, that are concerned. But in my case, if, if you come to Tanzania and you have any difficulties, please come and see me. My doors will always be open. I'm expecting lots of people to come up at the stage at the end of the yes. session to offer to yes. invest with you. Now, with, with regards to education, definitely we, we need to do more. We have to ensure that expand primary education. There is this MDG target of universal primary education by 2015. We have to invest more in building schools, train more teachers, get the textbooks, get the teaching materials, something that we need to do. We need to expand on, on secondary education. We need to invest more. Of course, our case, what we did with secondary school education is involve the communities. Because when we came in, we were taking 350,000 students in secondary school. We worked with communities. We were able to build 3,000 secondary schools, and now we have a population of 1.7 million students. The challenge has been manufacturing teachers. We, have, we expanded in, in uh, the university training, training of teachers. We, we, we are now almost getting there. We are now remaining with a shortage of 50,000 teachers, which you think in the next two or three years will we'll overcome that. We have to expand on, 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 on higher education. We have to build more universities, which we, we should. So, 
at times it is the government, but we, we, in our case we found with working with the communities has worked incredibly well. We have been able to, 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 to expand. So, but this is another area where we also need support. I, I'm going to ask if there's any other question from the floor and then call in President uh, Conde uh, to answer any points about either infrastructure, education, investment, regional cooperation that people want to raise, as, because these are the major issues that people have suggested. Yes, please. Can the mic go there? Thank you. Uh, I come from Nicaragua, Central America, and sometimes the, uh, the lessons of anti-corruption, which is a big negative incentive for investments, are not easy to apply. So I, as a Latin American, I would like to hear some of the African leaders give us lessons that can help attract investment and particularly uh, avoiding corruption. That's my area of expertise and I would, I'm, would be Thank delighted you. to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, President Conde, the new Africa and obviously the attack on corruption. I think that uh, one of the major issues in Africa is corruption, and that is why we have decided to produce a new mining code so that it's fully transparent, so that whatever happens in Africa is transparent. All the mining contracts will be published on the internet, everyone will know what's going on, and our partners must know that we are determined to carry out a transparent policy in the future, there will be no secret contracts, everyone will be treated in the same way, and the people will be associated with the determination of our policies. That's the best way of fighting against corruption. But I think uh, talking about railways and other infrastructure, Africa has to have a policy. If we have an African policy of infrastructure, the problem of bottlenecks uh, will be solved. If there is an African policy of energy, uh, then there will be uh, fewer bottlenecks. And therefore, what we need is is a, a minimum size of the market for those that uh, are not supposed to be profitable. Our markets are too short, too small, because we haven't been in, in uh, we haven't we been in able to define the continent-wide policy. Because we have been in 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 the continent-wide policy. Because we have after the Second World War, we have to use African Union to look at these issues. If we infrastructure is limited to one or two countries, that's not enough. We have to use African policy to look at all of these issues. If we use African policy, we need an African policy, and we all apply that African policy. If someone knows that the road being built is going to be a step on the road to have that road from Cape Town to Cape Town, we have to use that road from Cape Town to Cape Town. We have to use that road from Cape Town to Cape Town. We have to use that road from Cape Town to Cape Town. To give a different image that that than Africa has in the past, African leaders have to give another image to the world. They have to show that they are really concerned with the interests of their population, especially young people and women, and they have to do everything they can to ensure that their national resources are developed for the profit of their own people. And that will increase their capacity to consume and encourage the foreign investors to come to our country. If we remain in close contact with our neighbours in our own borders, we will not be able to do anything. If we don't provide full transparency to our managing 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 to our Prime Minister Meles, do you see the possibility of these transparency requirements going right across Africa? Do you see, as uh, President Conde does, uh, an African energy minister, an African infrastructure minister coming out of the African Union, or is that going uh, too quick? Well, um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure policy, uh, we actually have done a lot of the job already, the preparatory work already. Uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, PIDA, this is the infrastructure uh, uh, program for the whole of the continent. 
Uh, and in that context, we uh, also have a, a recent initiative by uh, President Zuma uh, for specific uh, infrastructure projects, whether it's uh, railways, uh, pipelines, gas pipelines, uh, roads, ports, and so on. Uh, we may need to do a little bit more. We may need to refine it. Uh, but I think most of the work has already been done. Uh, and we have the uh, NEPAD authority which is, uh, which is uh, doing this job and is going to coordinate implementation of, uh, of the continental uh, uh, infrastructure work. So much of the uh, preparatory work uh, has been done. Uh, but when it comes to infrastructure, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, what you said uh, when you were Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in, in, in the United Nations, uh, is very important. Um, uh, we need a new consensus uh, on infrastructure. The Washington consensus on infrastructure in Africa has not worked and it will not work. The Washington consensus on infrastructure in Africa is that the public sector should not do infrastructure. It's for the private sector to do infrastructure. Some infrastructure activities can be done by the private sector. But a lot of the infrastructure work has to be done by the private sector, or else it, by the public sector, or else it will not be done. And it's not just roads. So what we need from our partners is loans, technological support, capacity building. And by the way, a lot of that is already happening. Uh, there are partners particularly from Asia, the Indians and the Chinese, are investing a lot in infrastructure and through the African public sector. So we need more of that. We need to diversify uh, uh, that. Now, in terms of ministers of uh, uh, industry and agriculture and so on, at the Africa level, um, we need to coordinate, obviously. And, and we need someone there to uh, lead this coordination. But you can't will a common government for the continent in, into existence. It has to be a process of, of, process of integration. It took more than 50 years for the Europeans to, to come up with a common currency, uh, and it appears that uh, they, 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 it appears they went a bit too fast for some uh, of, their, of their members. So uh, we need to learn all the, uh, all the lessons carefully, and we need to move carefully. Here, uh, President Zuma, you've got Guinea with its energy offering to be part of a coordinated energy policy in Africa. Presumably that's quite attractive. <laughs> yeah, well, in, in one sense, yes, it is quite uh, <clears throat> uh, attractive. I, I think uh, Prime Minister Malas has, has, has really uh, responded to the issue. There is a lot of work going on already mm -hmm. in the infrastructure. We have five regional groupings yeah. that really coordinate the regions. And the aim is to emerge to a point where we'll be able to coordinate all of these. There are a lot of reasons why uh, you can't do it immediately. You have got it to move uh, step by step. I think President Gigwede referred to the three regionals yes. that have come together. That's part of the process that begins to move forward. What, through the NEPAD, what the AU has taken a very firm decision is really to ensure that we do the infrastructure in a coordinated manner as the continent. And that is coordinated in the main through the NEPAD, NEPAD uh, uh, structures. And it has substructures that are dealing with these matters. I think we are at that stage at this point in time. But I think what we need to do is to have the kind of understanding as the countries, how do we deal with our resources as a continent? That point, I think, uh, the, 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 the president of Guinea Conakry is absolutely correct. Can we discuss as the, as the continent, what do we do with our huge resources? Because for centuries, we have not determined what happens to our resources. It has been other countries out, out of Africa that have determined this. And of course, even now, and there's a point I made at the beginning, they would not want 
to leave us without influencing that kind of interaction. That is why I think there is a need for that discussion, to coordinate it broadly, uh, even between the regions. What do we do with our resources? Beneficiation, for an example, which is very important, so that what we have, what we produce, <clears throat> can then be utilized by us. It determined by us as to what is it that we want to do with it. From that point of view, I think we need that kind of discussion. And I'm sure a discussion even between the regional uh, economic, regional uh, uh, groupings, we can actually discuss that. I, I'm going to have to bring this session to a close by thanking our five prime ministers and presidents. Uh, I think you've uh, seen today a demonstration that the fastest growing continent in the world is determined to keep reforming, keep innovating, keep uh, coordinating its policies better, uh, give attention to the problems of infrastructure, education, regional cooperation, corruption, transparency, the better use of uh, energy, uh, and that uh, you have determined reformers here yes. who are you ready, to, who are ready to work with the rest of the world. Would you like this? And then no more civil primate. Je souhaite que, à la prochaine réunion de l'Union africaine, nous soyons d'accord de créer au moins quatre ministères africains, un ministère de l'énergie chargé de l'ensemble de la politique énergétique de l'Afrique, un ministère d'infrastructure chargé de l'ensemble de la politique d'infrastructure, un ministère du commerce qui fait en sorte que tous les entraves qui gênent le commerce entre les pays africains soient au moins, qu'on soit d'accord que ces trois ministres qui soient chargés de ces secteurs pour toute l'Afrique. For all of Africa. Well, you heard it here first. Uh, these uh, these uh, bold uh, suggestions about the future of Africa. But what you've got is a determination uh, from African leaders to lead the reform process. And I think that is a message that is being sent out to the world from here in Davos today. Thank you all very much. Could you thank our presidents and prime ministers for contributing to this great occasion?